My name is Dana Gagnon, and today I'm in disguise. Because today I'm recording myself in modern clothing. Well, mostly modern clothing. Let's not talk about exactly how old this clothing is. What I actually want to talk about is a question that many people have for me when I'm at historic sites. Normally, when you see me at a historic site, such as Locust Grove, I'm there to answer questions visitors have about the past, such as what did people wear or how did people cook? But sometimes visitors have modern questions for me, such as where are the bathrooms? But besides that one, often visitors want to know how I became a reenactor or how I started doing living history. And every reenactor has a different story about how they got into the hobby. And for most of us, it is a hobby, although there are a very few that manage to do it as their job and get paid. So I'll tell you how I got connected to reenacting. Way back in the old days, which was the 1970s, I was a little kid in Massachusetts and we used to visit a historical site called Old Sturbridge Village, which you may know is still there in Massachusetts. And in Old Sturbridge Village, when I was growing up, it was always the 1830s and they had living historians in the buildings in 1830s clothing and interpreting the different aspects of life in Sturbridge Village in the 1830s. And as a little kid walking around that village, I thought, how do you get to be those people? But we didn't live that close to Sturbridge and we only got to visit very occasionally as a treat. So I never found out how you got to be those people. But later, I moved with my family, now with my husband and my own little kid, I moved to Michigan. And in Michigan, I discovered Greenfield Village. And Greenfield Village also has people that dress in historical clothing and interpret the buildings for the era in which they're built. And you know, I discovered that as a grown-up, I still wanted to know, how do you get to be those people? But just like in Massachusetts, I didn't live that close to Greenfield Village and I never found out how you got to be one of the people that got to be a living historian in that village. So it was those big historic sites of Old Sturbridge Village and Greenfield Village that initially sparked my interest in living history. But it was a smaller one that finally made it possible for me to go further and get connected. When we moved my family one more time to Cincinnati, Ohio, I found a small historic village called Heritage Village Museum. And I discovered that Heritage Village uses volunteers in historical clothing to interpret their buildings. And I discovered that they were very accessible and open and welcoming to anyone who wanted to come to their museum and learn how to be one of those people. So by now I had a seven-year-old and I was a grown-up, but I decided I was not going to ignore this opportunity to do the thing I had wanted to do ever since I was a little kid at Surbridge Village. So I put my seven-year-old in the car and we went over to volunteer. And folks have asked me since, how did you get your daughter interested in doing living history with you? And the answer is, I never actually asked her. It was a project that I wanted to do, so I told her that's what we were doing next, which I guess is something you can get to do when your kid is only seven and they don't have a lot of say. As a volunteer at Heritage Village, I started to learn a little bit about historical clothing and how to interpret history for the public. I also met some people that invited me to join their reenactor group. And in those groups, I got to learn more and more detail about portraying someone from a particular historical era. And in this case, the reenactor group that I found was a group of ladies that invited me to learn about portraying ladies in the 1860s. It's been here in Cincinnati, this group, for over 25 years. And so I was really fortunate to have someone who happened to be part of Heritage Village and invite me to become part of that ladies group. And when you see me at Locust Grove, 
I am usually there as part of an 18th century event. Folks have asked me, do I do any other historical eras? Well, as I mentioned, the very first one that I got to participate in was reenacting for the 1860s. So those are the main eras I reenact. 1860s, Revolutionary War, and Regency slash Federal, depending on where I am. However, I will say that I have a really wonderful time sometimes visiting other eras that are not the main ones I research. When a friend invites me and she will dress me ever so carefully in garb that she has in her closet. This friend originally started doing living history with an Elizabethan focus. Sometimes we might travel to Elizabethan days. Sometimes we might travel to Viking days. It really just depends on what kind of wonderful events my friend has discovered and what kind of outfits she has decided to graciously dress me up in so that I can join her for another day. I won't say those are eras I do a lot of study in, but it is really fun to do extra time travel into other eras because as you test out all the layers of an outfit, you start to see what's different throughout different time periods. Um, every single time period that a living historian studies has a different fashionable shape and different fashionable underpinnings that make your outfit look right. So I focus on just those three. When I visit all these other ones with my friends, I get a chance to try out and see the difference for other time periods as well. Since I started many years ago getting involved in the hobby of living history, I have since taken over a group that invites high school and college girls to learn how to create their own impression and it's a group that focuses primarily on 1860s, but also branches into other eras because I branch into other eras and the girls were interested in other eras. So we do that too. That group is called the Western Female Seminary Living History Society. Um, and it's called that because that's the name of a ladies college that existed in Ohio starting in the 1850s and forward. I have also created first person impressions for several historical figures. And some of them are people that you might not be familiar with. They're not famous. They're real people, but they're not people that wind up in a lot of history books. Sometimes I might do a first person impression of Helen Peabody. And Helen Peabody was the first principal of that Western Female Seminary Ladies College that I mentioned. Another one of the first person impressions that I do is Judith Kemper. And Judith Kemper is not someone you would have ever heard of unless you live in Cincinnati and unless, even in Cincinnati, unless you happen to read a lot of early history of Cincinnati. Because Judith Kemper was the wife of the Reverend James Kemper. He came here to Cincinnati in 1791. And you see Kemper Road and Kemper Meadow and Kemper Lane all over Cincinnati because his family became one of the really founding families of Cincinnati. So I really enjoy portraying Judith Kemper. But I also portray Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she lived here in Cincinnati for 18 years. So there's a, there's a reasonable connection for me to do that in this area. Um, and that is someone that a lot of people have heard of, but not necessarily someone that they know a lot about. So being able to portray her is a chance to help me connect some history that folks might not have had a chance to learn by their interaction with me. So I really enjoy that about portraying Harriet Beecher Stowe. So all of this might make you wonder why on earth do I want to do this with my free time? And there are a lot of reasons I want to do this in my free time. Uh, one of them is I get to explore history and discover some unexpected things about everyday people. Um, you might be able to read about Harry Peter Stowe in a book, but you probably won't read much about Helen Peabody or Judith Kemper. But by learning about just material culture and everyday life and how women had to take care of their family and clothe their family and feed their family, uh, that helps me connect a little bit more to some history that I'm not going to find in a normal history book. 
Another thing I really love about being a reenactor or a living historian is I love interacting with the public. I love that connection. I love it when they have questions. I love it when I see that aha moment where they say, oh, I never knew that, that is so interesting. Uh, I love it when they say, I wanna go try that recipe at home. Can you, can you tell me what you're using and what you're cooking with? And, and not all reenactors love talking to the public, but that is just one of the things that I love about reenacting. And I admit, one reason I love reenacting is I love dressing up in the clothing. I love becoming someone else for a day. Um, in that clothing, I get to do things that I don't do in this modern clothing. I get to go dancing um, at balls or maybe an informal 19th century dance in the evening at an event. And the other thing about the clothes is that in order to make this hobby more affordable, the easiest way to do that is to learn how to sew your own clothing. Even if you didn't start off, I started off with some sewing knowledge. I have gained so much more sewing knowledge, learning how to make my own clothing so that I could participate in these history events. Well, that knowledge has translated into a better understanding on how to fit clothing in general, how to fit my modern clothing. And since historical clothing was usually made specifically to fit an individual, not just sort of a, a you know, baggy like this off the rack kind of shape, I feel better about myself in my historical clothing than I do in my modern clothing. So I admit, the clothing is part of the appeal. For me, the clothing is not the entire appeal. The, the clothing is kind of a ticket to get to do the other things like hearth cooking or dancing or just interacting with the public. Uh, but it does have its appeal all in itself. Some folks ask if I like to do reenacting because it's an escape. And I will say, this is 2020. I have absolutely enjoyed fleeing for the weekend back to 1804 for a while and hearth cooking in a stone kitchen for a couple of days and completely not looking at whatever might be in the news for a couple of days. That being said, I'm not a reenactor that finds the past to be a, the good old days, uh, romanticized, don't you wish you lived back then? So many people will say that if I'm giving a tour of the village uh, or just interacting with them. Uh, just visiting, especially this year from 2020, taking a trip at an event, it looks like just, maybe I should just step back into 1804 and forget the present altogether. And the thing about that is that does not demonstrate a thorough understanding of what was going on in that era. When I'm portraying women from 1780 or 1804 or 1864, each of those women were going through some difficult things as well as enjoying the things that I like to do at a reenactment. They were enjoying parlor games and they were enjoying dances and I'm sure they enjoyed their satisfaction to hearth cooking that you don't get from microwaves. That being said, they were in a country, depending on what time frame I'm in, they were in a country that was at war. They were losing husbands and sons and trying to keep things going on at home at the same time. They, in most of the cases that I portray, couldn't vote. They did not have, let's go there, they did not have indoor plumbing. That's something I really enjoy. So usually they did not have some of the modern medicine that we have. Do I love visiting the past? Absolutely, I love visiting the past. But it would be inaccurate to say that the past was warm and fuzzy good old days. And to be honest, it's those challenges that I love learning about that they were going through. Because when I share them with the public, it, it gives me a sense of, they have accomplished this. They got through this. They got to the other side of this. So we're in another place, um, no matter what's going on in history, whether it's 2020 or not. Um, we often find ourselves in places where there are difficult things in history going on in our world that we're watching happening as current events. Knowing that our country has an entire history of women who are strong and helping 
their whole entire country, their family, their own goals get through to the other side of events throughout our entire history, I think is more hopeful than looking at history as just, it was so much better back then, I wish I lived back then, in sort of a nostalgic way. For all of that, I will tell you, the biggest reason I love reenacting, and it's, it's the, not the reason you start usually reenacting, usually you start reenacting because the clothing is fun, or because you want to try dancing, or because you visited historic sites for years and wanted to be those people. But one of the things that will keep you reenacting years after year after year is the people that you meet reenacting. Because we will spend an entire weekend together and we will be cooking and we will be camping together and we will be freezing together and we will be getting soaked when it rains and our tent didn't stay still. Um, but we will also be helping each other figure out how to hold down the tent when the high, wi high winds come. And we will be getting to know a wide cross section of people that came together for a historic weekend. And what we have in common is that we think history is important. So that's a really great common bond. But then we might have so many other things that are not in common, which means we get to meet people of different ages, from different backgrounds, from different worldviews, from different kinds of careers. Uh, which leads me to, so what do reenactors do as day jobs? Are they all people who were historians? Uh, do they work at museums? And the answer is some of them. Some of them work at museums, but also like to do living history when they have free time. Some of them are engineers. Some of them are scientists. Some of them are park rangers. Some of them were college professors that taught writing. Um, nothing to do with history. Uh, well, I suppose that's a little to do with history. Some of them are uh, high school teachers, literature teachers, and my day job is actually at a local community access television station. For my day job, I don't do anything that has to do with history or old-fashioned things or anything like that. I work with computers and cameras and TV studio lights and microphones. So it's very, you'll find a, as big a cross section of backgrounds among reenactors as you will find stories for how they got connected to reenacting. There are a lot of other topics I could cover talking about reenacting and getting started and how do you find a group to get started and how do you know what to wear and well, now that you've got an outfit, what do you do at these events? How do, you, how do you learn how to do the things that you get to do at events? And to be honest, each one of those topics would take an entirely another video. So I think I'm going to stop here and do something my friends know is very uncharacteristic for me. And I'm going to end this conversation. But if you are still watching at this point of the video, then thank you so much for hearing a little bit about my story about why I reenact. And again, that's one person. There are as many stories about why people reenact and how they got started as there are reenactors. And next year, when we are done having virtual events because of COVID, and I don't have to stay here in my backyard in modern clothing, are mostly modern clothing. Let's not go into that again. But next year, I hope that I will see you in person at historical events at sites all over the place, including Locust Grove. And if you have any questions that you still remember after watching this video, I want you to come find me at these historic events and ask me in person. 